What skills, knowledge, and abilities do students develop as they navigate through college? How do students themselves know and how do institutions arm their graduates to show prospective employers what they know and can do? Hello, and welcome to this week's episode of The Key, Inside Higher Ed's News and Analysis Podcast. I'm Doug Letterman, editor and co-founder of Inside Higher Ed and host of The Key. On this week's episode, we explore an effort to iterate beyond the academic transcript, which has historically been the main tool available to students, institutions, and employers alike to sum up what's gained during the college experience, and not a very effective one at that. In this episode, we're joined by Nsia Bream, Assistant Vice Provost for Data and Systems at the University of Maryland Global Campus, to explain the, quote, comprehensive learner record it has created to help its MBA students better capture and describe the full range of competencies and learnings they've developed throughout their educational experience at the institution. And Sia talks, among other things, about how the learner record can help students translate what they've learned to potential employers and others. When we're talking about specifically what is learned in the MBA program, we're giving them specific language right on that document that they can pull into a resume um, or into an interview, right? And so it's, and, and then they don't have to remember, okay, like, you know, when did I learn that? How did I learn that? I mean, it specifically ties, okay, I did this project. This is how I accomplished it. um, And these were my outcomes. And so it just kind of puts it right in front of them rather than them having to craft their learning and and articulating that on their own. We'll also hear from Matthew Patinsky, CEO of Parchment, whose credentialing service UMGC uses to deliver its learner record. Matt describes why a more dynamic transcript which is often discussed in the context of professionally focused learning like at UMGC, could actually help liberal arts institutions make their case for the value of what they do. That if you are a believer in the value of a liberal arts education because of all of these skills that it develops, then you should be at the front of the line in insisting that your institution innovate its records to reflect those skills, to reflect those learning outcomes, Before we get started, a reminder to subscribe to The Key Podcast on Apple or Google Podcasts or your favorite podcast platform. And a shout out to Wiley Education Services, the sponsor of this week's podcast. Here's a word from them. Hi, I'm Todd Zipper, president of Wiley Education Services. This episode is brought to you by my new podcast, An Educated Guest. Be sure to check it out. I will be bringing together great minds in higher ed to dive deep into the innovations and trends that will guide the future of education and careers. No small talk, just big ideas. Subscribe and listen on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. On to today's guests, Nsia Bream of the University of Maryland Global Campus and Matt Patinsky of Parchment. Nsia and Matt, welcome to The Key, and thanks for being here. Thank you for having us. Uh, and see, uh, if you could maybe tell us a little bit, start by telling us a little bit about the project that you've got underway at UMGC, what its goals are, and how it's going so far. UMGC worked on developing a comprehensive learner record. And in my mind, the definition of what a comprehensive learner record is uh, really depends on your institution and what you want it to mean to your students. So for our student population, um, over 80% of our student population is either working full-time or part-time. So they have some sort of connection to employers. Um, They're continuing their education for a very specific reason. And so our entire goal of this project was to provide them with a digital record that they can actually um, do a couple of things with. One is really share the credentials that they earn at UMGC easily with whoever they need to share it with. And secondly, and most importantly, to really articulate their skills uh, in terms of what they're learning and to be able to communicate that to others so that they can easily reach their goals and their next steps. Um, And for us, you know, we used um, as a starting point our students who are in our Masters of Business Administration programs And the reason that we did that is because, um, again, uh, first of all, the coursework was just a really nice fit to what a comprehensive learner record can bring. And again, at the graduate level, um, these students are coming back for further education to really build on their skills and learning to get to their next steps. 
Matt, can you put what University of Maryland Global Campus is doing in some national context for us based on your work trying to improve the translation of what happens academically and otherwise on college campuses? Absolutely. Uh, when you look at a University of Maryland Global Campus comprehensive learner record, two things will stand out. One is it's very visual, so it's much easier to make sense of. And two is it goes deeper than a traditional transcript. As described, it presents the competency information and learning outcomes that that student has achieved. That's what a transcript is supposed to be about. That's what a credential is supposed to be about. It's supposed to summarize what we know and how well we know it not as deeply as an e-portfolio where you're getting into all the different evidence and artifacts, but certainly more than just courses and credits. So this idea of a comprehensive learner record is that we should innovate the transcript. We know so much more about the co-curricular and internship and competency and the broader educational experience that a student goes through than what we include in our transcript. And we're in a time when employers and the connection of higher education into employment is so prominent as a, as, a, as, a, as a focus for institutions, that by innovating the record, we don't just kind of meet students where we should be meeting them, which is summarizing all that they've learned, but we give them a record that I think is much more responsive to what employers are interested in, which again, isn't simply courses and credits. That's important to other institutions. If you're transferring or going on to graduate school, they wanna know what have you learned and how well you've learned it, um, both traditional courses, but also things like leadership, communication, you know, those softer skills. This is, I think, likely to be if not new terrain, uh, probably somewhat unfamiliar terrain for a lot of our listeners. And I guess I'm, I'm curious if you can go into a little more detail around what's required to, to populate a better transcript. What, what kind of information gets pulled? How much of that information pre-existed uh, the, the creation of the learner record? Where does it come from? And who, who needs to participate in it to, to make it all happen? Uh, and see if you could start from the U UMGC standpoint. Yeah, um, so what it really comes down to is the data, the data that's available on your students and their progress and where that lives and how easily you can take that data and put it into a digital format. So I think something that most institutions battle with today is that they're, they're they have multiple systems. So they have a student information system, a learning management system, a document management system, and all of that houses different components of who that student is and what they're learning. And so, you know, I think for us, what, what really helped was that we had a data warehouse where, you know, the, the information about a student and their progress is housed and we could pull from there in terms of their projects, their competencies, their learning, their courses, where they are in their progression, and that all becomes the record. Ultimately, I think what's, what's important is that this sort of information is shareable. So it's shareable with other institutions, it's shareable with other organizations. And so at the end of the day, it really just comes down to the data and the data that's available. So uh, that is pr maybe true at a place like UMGC, where mm -hmm. you've probably already uh, built into the tip every course or most courses uh, competencies and 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 then perhaps judged or shown how much and how successfully students have have mastered those. I, I'm not sure that data those data exist around the rest of higher education. And so again, maybe Matt, maybe you can jump in and and talk about sort of how. Um, how translatable is this idea to a four-year undergraduate liberal arts institution that, that takes place where, where most of the activity takes place in person except for the last year? I'm guessing there are a bunch of places where all this data don't all these data don't exist already. I think that's very fair. And it's one of the key questions when it comes to adoption. It's not uncommon for a provost or a president to see a CLR and say, I want that. Like, that's just beautiful. And I want my students, when they show up 
using, for example, a traditional four-year liberal arts college, when they show up as a freshman, I want them to see that as the palette upon which they're going to paint. I want them to see that this is what we're going to be able to produce for them on the other side that's going to advance their education and career goals. And that is a very motivating factor to draw them into the campus to produce that kind of a record. I think more than your, more than your tone <laughs> might, might indicate. I mean, in liberal arts colleges, thanks to the leadership of AACU, we have this notion of high impact practices. Already in the context of accreditation, uh, the degree programs and curricula are organized into themes at many institutions. Lots of institutions for a while have tracked co-curricular participation in more formal ways from University of Pittsburgh to Elon to Oklahoma and others. And so it's certainly fair to say that not every institution has, certainly not, not the breadth of institutions that have courses and credits and grades, um, but many have. And the last piece I would share is a CLR again, um, as Nsia mentioned, means different things to different institutions. It's ultimately about innovating the transcript. So for some, it may very well be presenting traditional transcript data in more insightful ways. So for example, you can show a pie chart of courses taken by subject matter. You can show achievement over time. So it's clearer than a traditional GPA at the end, how a student may have done poorly in their first semester, but then improved over time at a pretty high level. Um, you can show how the student performed within grade distributions if that's something your institution does. So we expect for some institutions, the CLR will be a visual representation of traditional transcript data to make more, that's in a more sensible way for an employer. For other institutions, it will expand the content um, and the depth of information that's available in a transcript as, as UMGC has. So you're saying it's, it's not hard to be better than the transcript. Uh, <laughs> and there are just all sorts of ways that one might do that. That's right. I mean, the transcript is this really low fidelity record relative to the high fidelity amount of information that universities have about what students do and how well they do it and the learning outcomes uh, from their programs. It's not hard to make a transcript a little bit higher fidelity than, than what it is today. But but there's a but there's a potentially really big continuum about there what that a, might look like. There is a big continuum, and just to be clear, you know what Parchment does in our technology in the CLR service is in many ways it's sort of like a microphone at a concert. It's like the least important part of the concert, right? It's the musician and the experience. But then again, if the microphone and the sound system don't work well, you know it's not going to be a great concert. If you don't ultimately produce it in a record you've really lost a big impact of what you're doing. But of course, the real work is the work of program design and assessment and all the stuff that is ultimately being summarized in that record. Right, Incia, you wanna jump back in? Yeah, so actually I just wanna point out that there's a very specific reason that we started with our MBA program. Now, I will say that you know we are a very large school, so it still gave us a really nice sample size of about 5,000 students, but it there, there's, it's a transition for us. And so we picked that program because, you know, it was set to sort of represent a digital record like the CLR. But what it also did was by having that starting point, um, we were able to kind of use that now moving forward as we continue to develop, um, like for you know, a way to that we need to actually structure our curriculum and our data behind the scenes to be able to continue to, to build on something like this. So I think to Matt's point, I mean, for us, even for us, it's a starting point and we can now use it to continue to get our, our data, our curriculum, our learning outcomes in shape to be able to support other digital initiatives as well. So, so it might, the CLR might look different even within UMGC by school Absolutely. or by program and got it. So, so how much, uh, thinking about sort of all the constituents uh, on, a, on a campus, what changes in behavior, who has to do things differently to make this work? Is it, uh, you know, from the student to the faculty to the uh, record keeping uh, administrative functions, wh whose jobs or whose, whose work and, and whose behavior has to change and where 
in your experimentation so far in CIA, have you seen snags or where do you feel like there's the most movement that needs to happen? In my mind, this is really an end to end change. So I think, you know, from the minute that you intake a student into an institution to help them kind of understand what this record is, how you use it, what it can do for you. Um, I think that's just a fundamental kind of how you advise students and teach them what something like this is. And then I think, you know, for most schools, when you when it comes to the registrar world, it's really kind of a, a change in thinking how we sort of represent a student's learning, right? The transcript dates back to, I don't know, the 18th century maybe. So, and, and, and the format really, I think in my mind hasn't changed much. So um, I think, you know, from there, it's a change there. And then it goes all the way to graduation when you're distributing credentials to a student. So it, for me, it's really, I think it's a, a, an entire university mindset shift um, that needs to take place in order to sort of adapt these types of practices within your institution and then help teach students, you know, what this is all about, why we're doing it and, and what it enables the student to do. I'm talking to Nsia Bream from the University of Maryland Global Campus and Matt Patinsky of Parchment. Um, Matt, thinking again about your sort of broader system view, one of the challenges in, in higher education is the um, great diffusion of institutions and the fact that so many different institutions do so many different things differently. And that creates issues when you're talking about cross-institutional movement, which we're obviously seeing more of. How, tell, talk a little bit about sort of how this, something like the comprehensive learner record is designed to, uh, to sort of overcome that diffusion and what has to happen systemically or maybe ecosystemically for it to actually take hold broadly. It's a great question, and I think it calls out two things that are in tension with each other. The first is higher ed is very diverse, and a big idea of the CLR is that it's a reflection of the charter and the distinctiveness of the university that's issuing it. So if I went to UMGC, I would expect to get something similar to what they're producing in terms of this focus on competency that have been assessed, you know, aligned with my career goals. I went to, as an undergraduate, not too far away, American University, and there, you know, the promise was Washington will be your, your campus, you know, internships, you're going to study the liberal arts, but you're going to do it within professional schools around international service or communication or public affairs. And so one would expect an AU comprehensive learner record would track that and report that in, uh, as an official document on behalf of the institution. And so, CLRs have exactly as you described, a diversity in forms and formats. Now that is intention, intention to the fact that nobody wants to get a record and have to spend 30 minutes to orient themselves to it, right? That doesn't scale. So if I'm an employer recruiting across multiple institutions, the transcript may stink, but I know that it's gonna be two columns or three columns. I know it's gonna be organized in time. I know that at the bottom, the last GPA is probably gonna be, you know, an average of all courses across all time and so on. And so we need as a community over time to develop a format for CLRs where there's a visual language that brings a certain consistency to how things are presented that's flexible enough so that what is presented is distinctive to the institution. And that's what we've tried to do in the CLR service is bring a set of charter institutions together as diverse as Elon University and UMGC to say, are there some common ways, even though what you're representing is very distinct, are there some common ways that we can represent it so that even as these are distinct records, someone receiving them can make sense of them uh, it's also important that they include machine readable data and that the machine readable data be standards based and IMS has a great CLR standard so we can talk more about this, but we've got to create a space of innovation and experimentation that also has a certain degree of standardization and consistency to get that tension right. Well, the, the other no that's really helpful, the, but the other the other element of it uh, is that to the extent that this is meant to be a learner record you'd like to think that there is, is the goal for there to be one for a learner 
such that from that it's somebody who has been not just transferring from a two year to a four year, but potentially there and back and all around and taking courses from multiple institutions virtually, et cetera, which is obviously the broadly the direction that I think we're increasingly moving in. Is there a true comprehensive record for a learner? Yeah. Ind independent of institutions. So that's yeah, obviously, well, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you think with the word comprehensive. I think that's <laughs> right. I mean, I think when most people think of a CLR, they think about it in the way that NCIA described, which is an innovative transcript from an institution's perspective. Right. But that's the importance of machine readable data and standards based machine readable data is it allows you to open your imagination to third party services that could allow you to bring them in from multiple places and create a record of records over over time. Um, and I do think that's, you know, part of the future as well. And it also brings in the question, the learner also brings in the question of learner agency over what's in the record. There's not much dispute that a transcript, what is in a current transcript today and what level of control a student has, which is pretty little. Um, you know, but if I don't want to disclose that I was college Democrat or college Republican, if I, you know, um, ultimately decided to change careers and don't want to include competency information for things that are, you know, unrelated to what I'm pursuing, you know, a, an interesting dimension of the CLR is how far we go in empowering the learner over the record. And Sia, as, as you are implementing this, starting to implement this at UMGC, I know UMGC presumably has lots of students who have multiple previous institutions and ex educational experiences in their in their backgrounds. I don't know whether the pool of business school learners that you're focusing, MBA learners that you're focusing on are more or less start to start to finish at, at UMGC, but how do you think about that question of sort of the institutional, the record of, of a student at an institution versus something broader? And, and have you run into that yet? Yeah, I mean, I think it, it comes down to the question of um, technology and, you know, like who the issuer is and, and how we can make sure that a record like this is validated and 100% insured. And, and for us, you know, as a starting point, we used specifically what the student is doing at the institution. And, uh, you know, I think for our students that, you know, one of the questions that they're going to have is, well, can I add in, you know, this accounting certificate that I did here? Can I add in this certification? And I think that, you know, that's something that we're going to have to be open to and consider because it, you know, when we're living in this world of learning is everywhere um, and you're talking about a record that is trying to show everything that a student knows and can do, uh, and then you don't necessarily know specifically what, what their angle is or what they're trying to do with it, um, it definitely starts opening up that conversation of, you know, what more can we do and how can we make this more meaningful to the student outside of just what they're doing at your institution. There's been a good bit of recent questioning by employers of whether graduates are emerging with the knowledge and skills the employers say they need and want. And one of the things I wrestle with is how much of that is because of an actual deficit in what students know and can do versus students' inability to explain or employers' inability to understand what the students have learned. How do you see the influence of those different factors? And to the extent that something like a learner record is about translation, does it have the potential to make a difference? In higher education, generally, you kind of uh, congratulate the student once they've earned their final credential. And I think what a comprehensive learner record really sort of um, allows a student to do is focus on their learning along the way. So if they've completed 60% of their coursework, you know, there is a ton of learning and skill that they've taken away. And so let's say that they're up for a promotion at work. Um, and really those skills that they were looking to gain were accomplished within that first 60% of their program, you know, that enables them to actually move forward with their career goals quicker than when they actually earn that final degree. And so I think that's really a, a powerful component of being able to kind of show them, um, you know, they're learning along the way, not just when they've earned that final credential. I think in addition to that, 
giving them like so for us when we're talking about specifically what is learned in the MBA program we're giving them specific language right on that document that they can pull into a resume um, or into an interview right and so it's and and then they don't have to remember okay like you know when did I learn that how did I learn that I mean it specifically ties okay I did this project this is how I accomplished it um, and the, these were my outcomes. And so it just kind of puts it right in front of them rather than them having to craft their learning and, and articulating that on their own. And, and uh, Matt, before we come to you, it, it, as you were talking and see, it made me think that it probably has the potential to help institutions be more intentional uh, about what they are ensuring students are exposed to and whether they're gaining it. I don't know, Matt, uh, but yeah. feel free to please jump in. Yeah. I mean, C and I are both nodding our heads as, yeah. <laughs> as aggressively as you can. Um, and so I'm giving away that we can see each other on Zoom, even though it's an audio <laughs> podcast. But, um, you know, I can't really expand much on what Encia said. I think it was spot on. What I would bring in a different type of institution, which is the liberal arts institution. I'm an unabashed promoter and believer in the value of a liberal arts education. I think the critique of the liberal arts education is as, as deaf to or unresponsive to the needs of the workforce is completely wrong. Um, in fact, it's contrary to what you know most or many surveys say. Um, I think we're a better economy, society, uh, you know, certainly we're better <laughs> polity, uh, the, more, the more individuals uh, who graduate with a liberal arts degree. I taught sociology, sociology of education, research methods. When I taught sociology of education, I taught students, I didn't assume that many of them would go on to be sociologists, let alone sociologists of education, right? I wanted them certainly to be thoughtful as learners and as parents and participant in the educational system as voters. But ultimately I said, your learning objectives are to write well, speak well, think analytically and be comfortable with numbers. And so Chevette is the context in which I'm gonna help develop those four skills. So this is a very long winded way of saying that if you are a believer in the value of a liberal arts education because of all of these skills that it develops, then you should be at the front of the line in insisting that your institution innovate its records to reflect those skills, to reflect those learning outcomes, because that's the existential threat to liberal arts institutions is a belief that they are not developing what I describe as evergreen skills. I think it's absolutely absurd to take the argument that because the skills demanded by the economy are changing so rapidly that somehow the traditional degree should be hyper responsive, that seems like a fool's errand to me, as opposed to doubling down on the evergreen skills that are gonna drive you over your life course, and then recognize that there's certificates and other kinds of programs that are gonna round that out. And again, I'm not speaking for every type of learner and every type of institution, I get that. Um, but that's my reaction to the, the broad question that you framed. And Sia, what are the next steps at UMGC in terms of moving the comprehensive learner record concept forward? What are the steps ahead if this is to get ingrained in how the university operates rather than be a one-off or a, a niche thing there? But I think in order to move forward, there are some key things we do have to focus on. One of which is really just, you know, aligning all of our programs and their outcomes to support, you know, uh, like, like a CLR or other type of credentialing. I think that's really important. And I think to your point, um, really getting, you know, our, our programs and our, um, uh, you know, those who are in, in the schools to really sort of focus on a different type of creation that that's meaningful for a student in this way. Um, I think that's really important. And, you know, just there, there's a lot of different angles here, but I think one is just, I think that focus and ultimate goal of allowing a student to articulate their skills um, is really always going to be our focus as long as we're focusing on, you know, what can the student do in the classroom? What are they, what are their takeaways? Um, but then also connecting and learning from employers too. Um, you know, figuring out, okay, like, is this something they'd include in their hiring practices? If so, you know, is there other content that they'd like to see on a document like this? So really connecting both uh, the academic side along with the employment pieces 
Um, but also just making sure that the language we use um, in academia matches the language that's being used out in the marketplace. Um, I think that's really going to be so important when connecting our students to the opportunities that they're seeking. That was the University of Maryland Global Campuses in Sia Bream and Parchment's Matt Patinsky. Thanks to them for joining us and to Wiley Education Services for supporting this episode of The Key. And thanks to all of you for listening. This is the 50th episode of The Key, and we at Inside Higher Ed are deeply grateful that you're choosing to spend your time with us. We'll see you here next week. Until then, stay well and stay safe.